With Scarlet and Violet here and the newest season of VGC almost upon us, I'm sure you're wondering, how difficult is it to build a team in this game, and how much have they improved the formula from Sword and Shield? That's what we're going to tackle today in this video. I'm going to be building a VGC team from scratch on my copy of Pokemon Scarlet to see if the game will be filled with hacking and cheating again, as it has been for years, or Game Freak finally made it accessible enough to the point where it's really, really easy and fast. Typically in these videos, I build a former World Championship team, but since Worlds haven't happened yet, I'll be building a team I design myself. I'll be comparing it to the time it took me to build Edu's 2022 World Championship team from Sword and Shield, and to the time it took me to build Ray Rizzo's 2011 World Championship winning team. Edu's team is because it's the most recent gen, but I chose to include Ray Rizzo's team because the format is likely the same. Regional decks with no restricted Pokemon allowed. So, if you haven't seen those vids yet, please check them out. With that said, let's go over the rules of the challenge. I'll be starting from the post game. I've got 6 star raids unlocked and have fully completed the main story, and I've done nothing else. I've not gone out of my way to buy any special competitive items, but I may have some from natural story progression. I'll also not be using any glitches or exploits. I want to see what Game Freak thought was acceptable for team building, so I won't be using the date skip to reset raids, farm items in the desert, or cheese any other time sensitive events. I also will not be using the clone glitch with Koridon at all. They didn't plan for us to use any of these tricks, so using them could make building a team easier than was intended by Game Freak, and I don't want to give credit where it's not due. Lastly, since I'll be trying to go quickly, I'll have a live timer in the upper right hand corner of the screen keeping track of how long it takes me to do every task. Without further ado, let's begin with the setup. The first thing I had to do is plan a team. My favorite playstyle is Trick Room, and I knew I wanted to use at least one of the new Paradox Pokemon. Since I have Scarlet and those Pokemon all have Protosynthesis, which boosts a stat of theirs under the sun, I settled on an archetype I've used before, Sun Room. This team intends to run Torkoal as a big damage dealer, with either Lilligant using After You on him, effectively giving Torkoal Lilligant's Chlorophyll boosted speed, or Uranguru with Instruction to deal massive damage under Trick Room. For the Paradox Pokemon, I used Brute Bonnet, who gets a power boost under the sun, and functions very well under Trick Room because it's slow, and Fluttermane, who would get a speed boost under the sun and is a good special attacker. Lastly, I brought Hariyama, who is generally a good VGC mon under Trick Room and has some utility with Fake Out. My EVs for the most part are a Brain Dead 252252. This is because the meta is really new, so I have no idea what thresholds I'm trying to hit or live. Plus, what my EV spread is doesn't really affect how difficult team building is in game anyway. Alright, after planning the team, the first thing I did was sell every single one of my treasure items I had acquired through my story mode playthrough. This netted me about 600k Poke Dollars which would be helpful with item acquisitions later on. The next thing I did was start to get dittos. Since I'm making a Trick Room team, a strategy which requires a Pokemon to have a zero in speed, I have to get a zero speed ditto for breeding. For some reason, there is no way to change a Pokemon speed stat to zero still, despite the fact that you can change it to 31 using bottle caps. So I went outside of Medali and used the lock on strat to find as many dittos as I could. After 33 minutes, I had a zero speed ditto, along with a few dittos with good natures that I could use for breeding later on. After that, I had to find a five or six IV ditto for breeding, which you can only do through raids. I spent a ton of time running around the map solo farming for raids looking for any ditto at all. Raids in these games can spawn any Pokemon anywhere on the map, making it far less consistent than what Sword and Shield had to offer, where the same dens always spawn the same types of Pokemon. This was difficult. 5 star raids are tough to solo, so I spent some of my candies leveling up my starter, Magnezone, and Coridon to try and beat some of the raids that weren't so easy. The general strategy was to fly to an area and clear out all the nearby raids. Then I would check the online bulletin to see if there was any dittos there. After all, I would have to do every single raid on the map if I wanted any new raids to spawn. Either that or wait a day. Despite doing them online and offline, this was a huge grind. After 2 hours and 3 minutes, I found a 5 IV ditto in an online raid. It had every stat except defense as a 31 IV, which was okay because one of the random dittos I caught while looking for a 0 speed ditto had a 31 in defense. So, I can deal with this. <laughs> At least it's over. Our total time so far is 2 hours and 38 minutes. The prep work in Gen 5 took me 11 hours and 35 minutes, whereas in Sword and Shield, there was basically no prep time. It took me so long in Gen 5 because I had to grind for a bunch of items to use for EV training in the battle subway. I'll just be able to buy them with money in this game instead of BP like in the other games, which is awesome. Well, that's it for all our prep work. Now it's time to start catching and breeding. First up is going to be Brute Bonnet. This Pokemon is only caught in Area 0, and it, along with all the other Paradox Pokemon, cannot be bred. Since it needs a 0 in speed as well, I have to catch a ton of them, just like I did with Ditto. But it does not have a very high spawn rate, so I use some sandwich skills to make up for that. A Lettuce Sandwich with Sour and Salty Herba Mystica grant me the Encounter Power Grass Level 3, which will drastically increase Brute Bonnet's spawn rate. Then I just went into Area 0 and spam battled with my Magnezone until I caught a 0 speed Brute Bonnet. I'll have to fix its IVs and natures up with Bottle Caps and Mints later on, but... 
At least I have the zero speed taken care of. After Brute Bonnet, I went around collecting parents to breed with. I had a Lilligant from a raid I did earlier during the grind, as well as a Makuhita from my story mode playthrough. For Torkoal, I caught the Static Encounter one in the West Province Area 1, because it is surprisingly rare otherwise. After that, I did one of my 5-star Oranguru raids that I had lying around. I couldn't beat it earlier, so I requested the help of my chat to defeat it. By the way, I streamed all of this right here live on YouTube, so if you want to catch this video and streams like it, please hit the like and subscribe button. With that said, Oranguru was surprisingly tough, but we did defeat it. The last Pokemon to catch was Fluttermane. The issue here is that Fluttermane is a nighttime only encounter, or at least I think it's a really low spawn rate if it's not nighttime. Not 100% sure on this. Anyway, in the meantime, while waiting for night, I did some shopping and prep for breeding. I bought a mirror herb for egg move transferring, which I ended up never using, but that's okay. After that, I bought the Destiny Knot and the Everstone, which are hold items to help pass down IVs and the proper nature while breeding. Lastly, I bought every single power item. These are useful for both EV training later on, which I'll explain when I get to it, but they are also useful for breeding. Every power item is tied to a specific stat, and if you have the Pokemon hold that power item while breeding, the corresponding stat will be passed down 100% of the time. This is how I'll be guaranteeing the zero speed gets passed down from my ditto. And before I continue, I have to say this is one of the biggest improvements of these games so far. All of these items are viable with just money, and they're viable with LP too actually, neither of which are too difficult to grind. They're all mostly reasonably priced as well. In previous gens, I'd have to grind in the battle facility or something else like that for hours until I could get the items I needed. But in this game, once I have enough money, I could just buy everything that I needed, which is really, really nice. All right, so with all the items for breeding purchased, I catch a Pokemon with Flame Body so eggs will hatch faster. So I quickly catch and evolve a Fletchling. And just as I get all that setup done, it's nighttime and I head back into Area Zero to catch a Fluttermane. Since Fluttermane is going to be max speed, I don't need any specific one, and I just caught the first one I saw, and then I head back up to the surface to breed. I'll be able to fix this Pokemon up with Bottle Caps and a Mint later on. Now, breeding in this game works a bit differently than it used to. Instead of the daycare, you can breed anywhere you want using the Picnic feature. And this is where I have some complaints. I hate this new system. A lot. Let's break down how it works, and why it's different than it used to be, and frankly, why I think it's worse. In this game, the way you breed is by having two Pokemon in your party and setting up a picnic, and then you just wait. After a certain, variable amount of time, you can find an egg in your picnic basket. This basket can hold up to 10 eggs at a time, and the longer you wait, the more eggs you receive. When you claim an egg or eggs, they always go directly into your PC boxes instead of your party. The first thing that sucks is the waiting. I waited for four and a half minutes and literally received no eggs. Why? This is an unbelievably long time for zero eggs. Even in the old games, if you had the worst possible combo, aka two Pokemon that don't like each other very much, you'd get one egg in that time period. Which leads to my second complaint, eggs going to the PC. Eggs going into the PC is extremely annoying because you cannot take them out of the PC while picnicking. Before, even during a slow breed, you'd get an egg and then continue running around with the egg you picked up while trying to generate a new egg. This does two things at once hatches the old egg so you can check if it is better than the current parent that you have and it also is still generating new eggs while you're hatching it. Now in this game you can only do one of these things at a time. I have to fully stop breeding and disassemble the picnic if I want to hatch any eggs at all. On top of this, since the two Pokemon you're breeding are in your party, whenever you want to hatch eggs, you have to deposit them, take your flame body Pokemon out, and then take all the eggs out. Old breeding had a really nice flow state, and even in the least optimal scenarios, you were always doing something, and usually two somethings at once. In this new style, you're either literally standing around doing nothing, praying to Arceus you get some eggs, actually not touching the game for five minutes at a time, or you're hatching ten eggs that could have been hatched during the five minute wait if this was the old game. Okay, I get it. Breeding is worse, but like... Can I do anything to improve this? Well, yeah, we can make some sandwiches. Making a sandwich in this game can provide you a ton of different buffs, and I used it earlier to increase the spawn rate of Brute Bonnet. Here, I'm gonna use it to make the egg power level two. The recipe I used is one banana, one butter, and one peanut butter. This grants both increased egg generation in a picnic and faster egg hatching outside of a picnic, and it lasts for 30 minutes. This grants me around one egg per minute now. Sometimes more, sometimes less. It really depends on how lucky I'm getting at the time. This helps me get close to the speed of the old gens, and you could probably beat that speed if you went for egg power level three. The issue is that requires Herba Mysticas, a somewhat rare item that's probably better served for other Sammies. And at the end of the day, this entire process feels less interactive regardless. I prefer the old method where I was always moving and playing. But what do you think? Let me know down below. 
Now that we know how the mechanics actually work, I'll talk about how my breeding actually went. First up was Makuhita. Makuhita needed a brave nature, which was one I didn't have. So my plan was to randomly breed until I got one with the right nature. I started out by breeding him with the zero speed ditto while it held a power anklet. So I got a zero speed Makuhita. Once I had that, I just bred the zero speed Makuhita with the five IV ditto, hatching eggs every time I got more than four in my PC, swapping out higher IV parents as long as they had the zero in speed. This ensures that I have the highest chance of a four IV zero speed Makuhita. The plan here was to breed until a brave one with zero speed popped out but after 40 minutes i got unbelievably lucky and hatched a 4 iv zero speed brave makuhita randomly all right it'd be nice if we just had a good one uh, this is it and it's brave what that's crazy did you guys see that that <laughs> i just randomly hatched a brave one with the exact IVs I need. That that's crazy. That's <laughs> It had the wrong ability, but I just used one of my many ability capsules that I had since you get a ton of them from doing raids to fix the ability. The process for everyone else was pretty much the same. I never worried about egg moves because you can pass them on using the mirror herbs after a Pokémon is hatched. Although none of the mons I used ended up needing egg moves anyway. Next up was Lilligant, which was going to be a bit easier because the parent was a 3 IV Lilligant from a raid, and I had a timid ditto to snag the proper nature. Otherwise, it's the same techniques as last time. Lilligant overall took me around 45 minutes. After Lilligant was Torkoal, who I had a quiet ditto for, so the nature would work out easier than Makuhita as well. During this time, I realized it'd be optimal to start moving around the map during egg hatching to pick up treasures and sell, and to talk to raid dens to get the LP that they provide, making a small amount of money during every egg hatching session. In the end, it took 52 minutes to hatch a Torkoal with 4 perfect IVs, zero speed and a quiet nature. Last up was Urenguru, who I also did not have the proper nature for. My plan was to first breed down the zero speed before spamming natures with the 5 IV ditto, but unbelievably the very first egg I hatched with zero speed had a sassy nature. Oh, I'm showing off a different time. I got really lucky with that stat spread. You. What the? F it's sassy. That's crazy. That's the one nature I needed. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's crazy. I was. That's a one in twenty-five chance. It literally just happened first rip. After that was the typical process, but I think my luck for the nature came back to bite me because this Urenguru took me 2 hours and 30 minutes. I kept getting really, really unlucky with the two 5 IV parent combos. But with that, I've got all four breeds I needed to do done. Now I just have to fix up the Paradox Pokemon that I have with mints and bottle caps. Luckily, I have four bottle caps already from raids earlier, so I just need to buy five more for Flutter Main. And thanks to all the raids and items I got during my story playthrough, I already have the two nature mints that I would need, a brave one and a timid one. Not that I couldn't have bought them for 20k though, so it's not like it was a huge time saver. With them hyper trained and minted up, we've officially got every Pokemon we need with the proper IVs, natures, and abilities. Getting every Pokemon here took me a total of 7 hours and 21 minutes. This took a surprisingly long time, but admittedly is an improvement from Sword and Shield, which took me 10 hours and 4 minutes. In Gen 5, this took me 17 hours flat. I actually expected it to be way faster in Gen 5, thank you to the RNG minips, but I seriously messed up in Gen 5 and bred the wrong timber twice, and Thunderous took me 5 hours there because it's a really, really difficult RNG minip. All in all, this seems to be an improvement across the board, but what about just breeding? I complained a lot about it, but how does this compare to Sword and Shield, where the breeding system is almost identical? I only did two breeds in Sword and Shield, and one took an hour and 15, and the other one took about 45 minutes. From my limited sample size here, that's about the same range of time. My breeds aside from Urenguru skewed a bit shorter, but I think at worst breeding is the same as Sword and Shield speed-wise. I just think it's stinky and I prefer moving around on the bicycle. Anyway, our new total time at this point is 9 hours and 59 minutes. In Gen 8, it was 11 hours and 8 minutes, and in Gen 5, it was 28 hours and 5 minutes. What? Whew. So far, Gen 9 is running away with a nice little lead. Now, we need to EV train all of our Pokémon. EV training is how we increase and customize our Pokemon stats in this game, and there's two main methods to talk about, vitamins and Pokemon KOs. Vitamins cost 10,000 Poké Dollars each and increase a Pokemon stat by 10 EVs every time you use a vitamin for the stat that it represents. It's about as simple as that. Each stat can cap at 252 EVs, and you can have a total of 510 EVs on your Pokemon. 
If you want to just max out a stat, you can dump 26 vitamins into that stat and it'll bring it right up to 252. The biggest issue is that EV spreads do not always end in multiples of 10, so we oftentimes have to augment them with the second method, Pokemon KOs. Every time a Pokemon is KO'd, it gives an amount of EVs based on its species. For example, Wingle always gives one speed EV when you KO it, and we can enhance this with the power items I bought earlier. They grant an additional 8 EVs per KO for the stat that they represent. This means if I KO a Wingle with the power anklet, I would get 9 speed EVs instead of 1. In older gens, we used to have Pokerus, a rare condition that would double the total EVs gained in a battle. But they removed that in these games, so we can't gain more than 11 EVs per KO this time around. In addition, Pokemon KOs have to be done with regular battles. Auto battles do not give any EVs at all. The plus side though is that the EXP share will grant EVs to every Pokemon in our party, so we can train multiple stats at once if we have to. Because these games are so new, I was actually not sure what the best EV training method was. My first guess was that it'd be just like Sword and Shield, and you'd use vitamin dumping plus some cleanup with Pokemon KOs. I was thinking about what would be the most optimal farming method for money. I knew that you could farm it with the Academy Tournament and an Amulet Coin for about 90 to 100k per round depending on the trainers, but that's kind of slow for vitamin buying. I ultimately decided the best idea was to do as many raids as I could. Raids give a ton of really good, valuable rewards to sell, along with actual useful items like EXP candies, bottle caps, PP ups, and Terra Shards. And you could catch Pokemon with good IVs to either bottle cap up later or to use as breeding parents. With that decided, the first thing I did was spend all my money on the vitamins for Brute Bonnet. I EV'd it to have max HP and max attack and a 4 in defense. After that, I decided Fluttermane was next to train. After I spent all my money on Brute Bonnet, it was time to grind raids for Fluttermane. So after two hours of this, let me tell you the sad truth. This is not that good of a technique. <laughs> the issue is that five and six star raids, which give you the best rewards, are really difficult to solo unless you've got an EV trained Pokemon with the proper Terra type to defeat it while it's also level 100. And honestly, playing online with people is even worse. When they faint, they cut into your timer, whereas the NPCs don't do that at least. I tried to mitigate this by candying a few Pokemon to level 100, including Brute Bonnet, but after this two hour grind, I barely had enough money to afford vitamins for Fluttermane. So I pumped its special attack and speed to the max and gave it one HP up, but I decided I have to try the other EV training technique because surely it's faster than whatever the hell I'm doing here. So with four Pokemon left to train, I bought two more power belts and one more power lens because a few Pokemon overlap in their EV spreads, so I could train them all at the same time. First up was the HP squad. I EV'd here by KOing Merrill in this section of the South Province Area 4. They grant two EVs each, so to max out a stat, I would need to KO 26 Pokemon. I keep track of how many KOs I am doing using my lead Pokemon's PP. And that's about it. After 18 minutes and 43 seconds, I EV trained the HP of Renguru, Makuhita, and Torkoal to the max. After that, I did my second training session with a Torkoal and Petalil. These two Pokemon both needed their special attack maxed. I decided to train against Mareep and South Province Area 2. Since they only give one special attack EV each, I would need to KO 28 Mareep with the Power Lens on. After all those KOs, I gave the Torkoal one Zinc to cap out four EVs into its special defense. This took me 22 minutes and 44 seconds. After that was Makuhita. I trained its attack to max by KOing 28 Shanks in South Province Area 3. This took me about 11 and a half minutes. And then I finished off Makuhita's EVs by giving it a Zinc for a special defense up. Next up was Lilligant, who I finished off by KOing 28 Wingle and Magikarp just south of your house in the South Province. I also gave it an HP up to have four extra HP EVs. Last up is Urenguru, who is the only Mon I gave a remotely complex EV spread to. I did Defense first, where I fought Karkol, Silicobra, and Orthworm in East Province Area 3 to get 140 defense points. After that, I fought Hopip in South Province, just south of Mesa Goza, for 92 special defense points. And then I finished off the spread with some Mareep to cap out EVs on its special attack. All in all, this took 30 minutes to finish Urenguru. A lot of it was spent on Hopip, who I am not sure is the best Pokemon to train special defense from, but that's not too big of a deal, and I'm sure I'll find a better spot later on. All in all, EV training took me 4 hours and 12 minutes. I'll admit to some wasted time here trying to do the raid grinding, but like I said, I was not sure of the fastest way to train in these games. Unfortunately, it was just so easy to grind for Watts in Sword and Shield that I thought surely it would be similar here. Well, how did the older games do anyway? In Sword and Shield, this took me 3 hours and 33 minutes to EV train. This really isn't that much faster than Gen 9. I was ready to write a big rant about how I am disappointed and annoyed that we're back to Pokemon KOs for training when vitamins were so fast, but I think the speed of the overworld battles evened this out a little bit. I still Still think it's too slow though. What about Gen 5? Well, it was 3 hours and 20 minutes. Wait, what? How is this faster than even Gen 8? I have to be honest, either of these games taking longer than Gen 5 is unacceptable. Gen 5 EV training is not what I would call fast or engaging, so shame on both Gen 8 and Gen 9. 
What the heck? With that, our current total time is 14 hours and 11 minutes of team building time. Sword and Shield were at 15 hours and 32 minutes at this point, and Gen 5 were at 31 hours and 45 minutes at this point. The modern games are pulling way ahead of Gen 5 at this point, but there's barely a difference between them. Next, we have to get our Pokemon evolved, have the proper moves, and have the proper items for battle. For this, I had to do a few things. First, I tackled any moves I could teach without leveling up. Liligant was first because it was the easiest. All I had to do was evolve Petalil with the Sunstone, and then Liligant can learn any of Petalil's level up moves from any level. So I taught it Leaf Storm, After You, and Helping Hand. Then I used the one Protect TM I had, so its moveset was done. After that, I taught Makuhi to Rock Slide via TM. Next was Torkoal, who I went to West Province Area 2-4 to find the TM for Solar Beam. After that, I realized I needed more Protect TMs. More? That's right. The devs at Game Freak decided that instead of having TMs be infinite use like they have since Gen 5, we'd be back to the Gen 4 days of only having one of each TMs. But now they're craftable, so I had to run around KOing Scatterbug to get the crafting materials for this specific move. Honestly, this is so ridiculous. I'm lucky this is my first team and I have all the TMs already, and this is like the only move I needed to craft. After the materials, I gave Protect to everyone but Makuhita and gave the rest of the Pokemon the TMs that they would need, which was Trick Room on Fluttermane and Seed Bomb on Brute Bonnet. Every other attack I'd need would be via level up. Uranguru needed to hit level 50 for all of its moves, Makuhita needed to hit level 54, and Torkoal needed to hit level 64. And this is where I did a two-in-one combo. I gave the amulet coin to my level 100 starter and started doing battles with it, my level 5 Koridon, and the three mods I needed to level up at the academy tournament. Spamming battles here granted me anywhere from like 80k to 100k for four battles, and since all the trainers have level 60 plus Pokemon, they all gained levels rather quickly. I also gave the Torkoal the Lucky Egg, which increases the amount of EXP it gains, since it was the one who had to hit the highest level. I wish there was more to say about this. Each round of battling took 12 to 15 minutes since you can't turn animations off and they kind of take a while, and I just battle spammed. I actually finished leveling up first, and once that was done, I bought all the items I needed along with 56 PP ups, which lets me increase the amount of times I can use each move to the maximum. And with that, we're all done. All this level grinding, grinding for money, etc. took about 2 hours and 49 minutes. It's a boring grind, but at least it wasn't that long. Or was it? Well, in Sword and Shield, this took 4 hours and 24 minutes to get all the TMs, PP ups, and mints, and an additional 9 hours to get the ability patches, if you think counting that is fair. So I would say that's quite an improvement. So many things here are just buyable with money, which really condenses down the grinding that you need to do into one thing. No more stupid BP things, or spamming raids, or whatever. And in Gen 5, this was even worse. PP ups alone took 11 hours, and everything else combined took 17 hours. All in all, my total time for building this team was 16 hours and 59 minutes. Gen 8 was at 29 hours, but if you subtract the time it took for the ability patch, it's only about 4 hours slower. And Gen 5 was 49 hours, which was pretty ridiculous. Overall, Scarlet and Violet are a slim... We have to talk about Terra Shards. You see, when I was planning my team, I wasn't actually even sure what Terra types I wanted. I had thought of a few good options. I was pretty sold on using Grass-type Torkoal for resistance changes and for Stab Solar Beam, but after consideration and talking to others, I realized Terra Fire is just better to make Eruption even more of a gigantic nuke than it already would be. And Torkoal is going to be the Pokemon I terra the most by far. The two supporting mods, Uranguru and Lilligant, really didn't need any special Terra types, since they would be supporting him, so it didn't make sense for them to Terra at all. I thought Ghost was the best for my cheesy set with Fluttermane, and I think Dark is a better stab than Grass for Brute Bonnet. Although maybe it's worth keeping Grass so it's immune to Spore, I'm not sure. My only real other idea was a Rock-type stab for Hariyama with Rock Slide, but I don't know, he didn't seem like a great Terra candidate to me. I imagine it's going to be one of my more powerful sweepers terastalizing anyway. But just because my team did not need me to change any Terra types does not mean that this isn't worth mentioning. If you want to change a Terra type, you need to spend 50 Terra Shards. This is too many. Let's take a look at what I have right now. Keep in mind, this is me having done enough raids to unlock 6 star raids, random raids during the story, and at least 4 hours of dedicated raid farming during the EV training section and while I was looking for a ditto. This is ridiculous. Without the date skip trick, this would probably take a minimum of 10 hours to get 50 Terra type shards. For a lot of Pokemon, you're probably better off searching for a raid of the random Terra type you want. But in VGC, where everything is optimized, you're going to breed for that zero attack and zero speed for Trick Room and minimum foul play damage. So you'll need to do this grind. All I can say is that without Terra Shard grinding, these games, while acceptable, really should have improved more than they did. And with them, it's definitely worse than Sword and Shield. I can't see this taking longer than a minimum of like 30 to 40 hours. While I did have fun building, I worry this level of inaccessibility is only going to encourage more hacking and cheating, and I can only hope DLC improves this more. With all that said, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys next time. I want to do a big shout out to all of my YouTube channel members. Without your support and generosity, I couldn't release as many videos and stream as often as I do. I want to do a special shout out to my Blissey tier members, Kimuroki, 
AB Twisty, and Fragiles. And I want to do a super special shout out to my Blist God tier members, Lucas, R-L-I-Z-T, and Shadowblitz56. You guys are all awesome. Your generosity is amazing. Thank you so much.